In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We see as we have the opportunity to celebrate the Feast of St. Ignatius this year on First Saturday, how much he figures as a sort of vigil to the Feast of the Purification, which we keep tomorrow, which brings us to a close of the Christmas season. We see that the Church does everything in her truly divine wisdom, and that is why St. Ignatius, like so many other illustrious saints, is placed during this Christmas season, and find, we find him now at the close of it. St. Ignatius was the third bishop of Antioch, the city of Antioch in Asia Minor, the third bishop, that is, after the apostle Peter himself, who founded the see of Antioch before going to Rome. He is one of the fathers whom I taught a couple weeks ago at the seminary. And along with his dear friend, St. Polycarp, St. Ignatius heard and was taught by the Apostle St. John. And it was again St. Peter who, after taking his permanent seat at Rome, appointed Ignatius the bishop of Antioch after the death of Abodius. And so it is that St. John Chrysostom, himself a native of Antioch, preaching some two centuries later on the feast of St. Ignatius, could proclaim, Rome, you gave us a bishop. We gave you back a martyr. St. Ignatius was then bishop of Antioch from the year 70 until 107, when he was martyred. He protected the church of Antioch from the ferocious persecution under the Emperor Domitian and afterwards enjoyed a short period of peace. But the Emperor Trajan then determined to have a sort of religious unity throughout the empire, especially in the east, and so he determined to have all the Christians of the east convert to paganism. This then would be the moment when Ignatius would obtain his lifelong desire to imitate the passion of his God. Unlike St. Paul, Ignatius was not a Roman citizen. He would be sent by the emperor, and as the account of his martyrdom records it, it was indeed the emperor himself who was visiting Antioch at that time who condemned him with his own mouth and declared that he should be sent to Rome, not to be beheaded, but to be fed to wild beasts in the arena. What we have as far as the writings of St. Ignatius are seven letters then which he wrote on the way to his martyrdom, going through Asia Minor, heading toward Rome. He wrote then to different churches and once to the bishop of Smyrna, his dear friend Polycarp, before arriving at Rome for his martyrdom. These letters of St. Ignatius are some of the most precious jewels of church patrology. Certainly, if you are looking for a good spiritual reading during these upcoming weeks, especially during Lent, you may read all the letters of St. Ignatius with my paternal blessing. St. Ignatius speaks to us very vividly as one of the first generation after the apostles of the divine institution of the church hierarchy, especially the importance of the bishop and of the bishop of Rome as the supreme head of the church. He speaks very eloquently of the incarnation and so also of the real presence of Christ in the blessed Eucharist and the sacrificial nature of the mass. All of that stems from his teaching on the Incarnation as he was trying to refute two heresies at the time, one which was hanging on, which the term for which we have coined by St. Paul, that is Judaism, that is an insistence that, that those who are Christians still must observe the Jewish law in order to be saved. In addition to combating this error, St. Ignatius combated the era of docetism, the idea that 
Christ come in the flesh and having truly suffered was all just an illusion, and that perhaps even Christ himself was a sort of illusion. He writes of the truth of the Incarnation then perhaps more eloquently than anyone else because he compares it to his own martyrdom, declaring that if Christ did not come in the flesh and truly suffer in the flesh, what is the point of going to be fed to the lions? Again and again, he refers to our Lord sometimes simply as the name, out of reverence, not even pronouncing the name of Jesus, but when he does, often he refers to him simply as our God, Jesus Christ. It is, however, and we find it scattered throughout his letters, with also great reverence that he invokes the name of Mary, which he seems to do more often than some other writers of the time. And so, because he wrote so early, and because of what he did say about Our Lady, we may truly say that he is the first theologian of the Blessed Virgin Mary. In his letter to the Ephesians, not to be confused with that of St. Paul, for often he wrote to the same churches, there is one physician, he says, who is possessed both of flesh and spirit, both made and not made, God existing in flesh, true life in death, both of Mary and of God, first passable and then impassable, Jesus Christ our Lord. And further on in that letter, let my spirit be counted as nothing for the sake of the cross, which is a stumbling block to those who do not believe, but to us salvation and life eternal. Where is the wise man? Where the disputer? Where is the boasting of those who are styled prudent? For our Lord Jesus Christ was, according to the appointment of God, conceived in the womb by Mary, of the seed of David, but by the Holy Ghost. He was born and baptized, that by his passion he might purify the water. And in a very famous passage quoted by St. Jerome, who says that he is the very first to consider this idea, that many of the mysteries that we read about in the gospel were in fact hidden from the devil until all was revealed finally at the resurrection. The virginity of Mary, he says, was hidden from the prince of this world, as was also her offspring and the death of the Lord, three mysteries of renown, which were wrought in silence by God. How then was he manifested to the world? A star shone forth in heaven above all the other stars, the light of which was inexpressible, while its novelty struck men with astonishment. And all the rest of the stars, with the sun and moon, formed a chorus to this star, and its light was exceedingly great above them all. And there was agitation felt as to whence this new spectacle came, so unlike to everything else in the heavens. Hence every kind of magic was destroyed, Every bond of wickedness disappeared. Ignorance was removed and the old kingdom abolished. God himself being manifested in human form for the renewal of eternal life. Our Lord promises us that the truths of our religion will be revealed like a mustard seed. That will be the kingdom of God that is the church. All the truths of our faith are to be found in that mustard seed, which over time grows into a great tree with many branches. But as we read the earliest fathers of the church, we find the truths of our faith contained as yet in that little mustard seed, which is only now beginning to sprout. But in the words of St. Ignatius, we find already the truth of Our Lady as mother of God, God-bearing one, and ever-virgin. As he concludes, to conclude this thought then, with his letter to the Trillians, stop your ears, therefore, when anyone speaks to you at variance with Jesus Christ, who is of the race of David and of Mary, 
who was truly born and ate and drank. He was truly persecuted under Pontius Pilate. He was truly crucified and truly died in the sight of beings in heaven and on earth and under the earth. He was also truly raised from the dead, his father quickening him, even as after the same manner his father will so raise up us who believe in him by Christ Jesus, apart from whom we do not possess the true life. By the intercession of our blessed lady, whose feast we keep tomorrow to close the Christmas season, may we be all filled with that spirit of St. Ignatius and cry out as he did in the midst of his greatest sufferings, let me imitate the passion of my God. At long last I begin to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen.